Good morning, everybody. Just waiting for the last few people to make it in from the waiting room. And I think we're mostly in. Thank you all for joining us today. We're glad to have you here. And just like we do every week, we're gonna start with some Zoom housekeeping tips and instructions. Please stay muted to minimize background noise unless you want to unmute yourself to ask a question. You're welcome to do that, but we do ask that otherwise folks stay muted during the Zoom. <clears throat> In order to mute or unmute yourself, you need to find your Zoom toolbar, which for most of you is probably at the bottom of your screen. That's where you're gonna find your mute and unmute buttons, as well as your start and stop video buttons. So if you need privacy, you're welcome to keep the video off, but if you want us to be able to see you, then of course we are happy to have you leave your camera on. <clears throat> um, the Zoom toolbar is also where you will find the chat button. And the chat is the best way to ask us questions. If you have new questions for us to answer today, or if you want to ask us to clarify something that we've talked about, the chat is the best way to do that. But again, like I said earlier, if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Every week we remind you that we are here to give you general information, not legal advice. And so I'm going to give you that same reminder this week and tell you that this means if somebody tells you, you have to do X, Y, Z, because Valerie said during the Zoom, fill in the blank, you can ignore them. That is also true of anything you see in the chat. It's just general information, not legal advice. Uh, it's also true if somebody sends you one of our blog articles or really anything else in a public forum like this. This is not a venue in which we can give legal advice. So sometimes when your questions come to us and they are many paragraphs long with lots of really specific information or excerpts from your governing documents <clears throat> or just super, super specific situations that are not the type of thing that a broad cross-section of community associations might deal with. Sometimes we tell you that your questions are too specific and that we can't answer them in the Q&A. <clears throat> Chelsea is the one who sends those emails, but I'm the one who makes those judgment calls. So if you're if you're mad about it, be mad at me, not at Chelsea. Um, and keep in mind that if you do need legal advice for a situation that your community is dealing with, the only person you can get that legal advice from is your attorney, your association attorney. And I'll take this opportunity to do what I periodically do, which is to remind you that if you don't have an association attorney yet, you should get one now when you don't need one. Because it's a lot easier when a crisis happens to... to Call up an established attorney that you have a relationship with and ask a question when they've already got all your documents on hand and they can be more responsive more quickly to you versus dealing with a crisis situation and having to scramble to even find an attorney to begin with, let alone one that can be up to speed on your documents and whatever situation it is that you're dealing with. So establish that relationship now when you're not in crisis and when it's not a time sensitive issue. As I mentioned earlier, please keep in mind that the chat is intended for you to ask questions or request clarification, not for discussion or commentary or arguments like you might see on like the CAI message boards. So just please keep that in mind. And also, I did put a message into the chat when we started our Q&A today, reminding everybody that if we don't have time to get to your questions that you put into the chat today, or if you think of another question you would like us to cover between now and next week, you can send that question to info at condolaw.net and we'll add it to our list of questions for next week. We do ask that you get those questions to us by 4 p.m. on Monday, so we've got the day on Tuesday to research and prepare our answers. And also in the chat, I put a link to our YouTube channel. So sometimes folks submit questions and then they're not able to attend the Q&A when we answer those questions. We know everybody has very busy lives, especially now as we're kind of rolling into the holiday season. My daughter this morning said, well, Halloween's over. Merry Christmas, mom, because <laughs> it's November 1st. <laughs> so busy lives. You, you may not always be able to join us li live for these Q&As. And so you can use the link to our YouTube channel to watch videos um, that you missed. We've also been reminding everybody, and it's creeping ever closer, that the recording fees are going to increase by $100 on January 1st, 2024. So if you have liens that you might consider recording or other documents that need recording and you have the ability to do that before the new year, it's a great idea to do that. 
And finally, we do want to let everybody know that we will not be having our Q&A the Wednesday of Thanksgiving week. I believe that's November 22nd. So <clears throat> please don't show up here Wednesday, November 22nd for the Q&A because we will not be here and you will just, you know, get stuck in that never ending loop of a Zoom meeting that doesn't start. Um, we're going to take the week off and try to enjoy a little extra time with our families. And we hope that you all get the opportunity to do the same thing as well. So I am going to go ahead and jump right into our questions because we've got quite a few today. The first one's a little bit long. Regarding the new pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency requirement, must we really send these out with the very first notice of delinquency? Or is the only consequence of not doing so that it will delay the process? These are comments from a board member. This is a manager that sent us the question. Section 6I61B says, if you've not provided the first notice, then you can and need to do so before you send the second notice and start down the foreclosure path. It simply delays the start of the process. My board will begin discussing this next week, but my guess is that we will choose to avoid the griping from members who deem the form letters threatening. We recently had a homeowner claim that the reminder letter he received about parking overnight on the street was threatening, even though no penalty was issued. To me, it's a trade-off between regular complaining by members against a pause in collection action activities in the very rare event we would choose to foreclose on a lien. So the question, the short, the short version of the question is, do we really have to send them with the first notice of delinquency or can we decide not to? And, you know, Jennifer and I, we work together when we prepare our answers to these questions. And she was ever so much more diplomatic than I was when she was putting together her comments. Because um, in my opinion, it is very cut and dry. The statute says you shall send the pre-foreclosure notice with the first notice of delinquency. Shall is a word that the courts interpret as requiring action. And so I think you have to send the pre-foreclosure notice with the first notice of delinquency, unless you want to willfully violate the statute. And that's the part where I'm less diplomatic than Jennifer. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a list of the statutes where this appears. And this is true across all of the common interest statutes in Washington state. So regardless of whether you are a community under the HOA Act, the Old Condo Act, the New Condo Act, or Wakiowa, you are required to send these notices of delinquency now. The statutory citations are RCW 6432-200 for the Old Condo Act, RCW 6434-364 for the New Condo Act, RCW 6438-100 for the HOA Act, and RCW 6490-485 for Wakaiowa. They all have similar language. And it says that you shall include a first pre-foreclosure notice when you send to the owner a, the, the first notice of the delinquency of their account. So um, the statute does provide for the option of the association attorney sending it if when the account comes to us, it hasn't been sent yet. But I have to tell you that I was part of the, I am part of the legislative action committee and I was very involved with the negotiations around adding this two-part NOD requirement. That This all happened earlier this year. The requirement that two notices of delinquency be sent is a new requirement as of July of 2023. And we had to fight really, really hard to get the legislature to even include the option of having the attorney send it if the association hadn't done so. And the only reason that the legislature agreed was because we pointed out that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of associations in Washington state that are not members of WSCAI, that don't work with an association attorney, and who would have no way of knowing that the law changed and now you know, now they're required to send these notices of delinquency. So in light of that, I think that if we, if we have associations that just willfully choose to ignore these requirements, our ability to secure those kinds of concessions from the legislative legislators when we are negotiating with them during session is, is going to be significantly diminished. In other words, they took us at our word 
and, and assumed that we were operating in good faith when we said, we only want this exception in there to protect associations that just have no way of knowing about the legal change. And if we start to see associations that just decide they don't like the statutory requirement and therefore fail to comply with it, I think the assumption of good faith on the part of the legislators when they are viewing the requests that we make to them um, is gonna go away. Also, I think it's worth pointing out that this exception, meaning the ability for the association to send the notice if the association fails to do so, is likely to be phased out in the future. That was not something that the legislators wanted to include long-term. And although we are not currently aware of any foreclosure-related bills that are gonna be coming up during the next legislative session, this is the first session in like three years where there hasn't been foreclosure-related legislation proposed during the session. It could still happen, but right now it doesn't look like there's going to be anything like that. Um, in other words, the, the legislature really cares about foreclosure and they revisit this topic frequently. So I, I, I do think that you can expect in the next probably three to five years that the exception allowing the attorney to send the notice that the association failed to send is gonna go away. And Ken added a comment when we were doing the prep basically saying that the legislature thinks they know better than you when this notice is needed. Um, and I that is perfectly in keeping with his more skeptical nature. I, uh, but what I will say is the reason that the legislature added this requirement and said, this has to go out with the first notice of delinquency. They had a really good reason in their minds. And it is because they want the foreclosure prevention resources that are on this notice of delinquency to get into the hands of homeowners sooner rather than later. So the short answer to your question is, yes, you really do have to send it. I think I don't wanna have to be an attorney standing up in front of a judge explaining that my client just didn't like the requirement and that's why they didn't send it with the first notice of delinquency. And um, Jennifer, if you want to have any uh, more soft diplomatic <laughs> comments or any other comments to add to this one, now's your chance. Um, honestly, I don't think any diplom any further diplomacy is needed. Um, the one comment I did want to make about the owner complaining that form letters oh, yeah. are... Um, uh, what was the word used? Threatening. Uh, threatening. Owners are going to complain about anything. There's not nothing a board or manager can do about an owner who wants to complain about being held accountable for their actions. So if the statute requires it, the statute requires it. Agreed. Um, there is a follow-up question in the chat about I thought we didn't have to send it with the delinquency notice, but with the foreclosure notice. And that is not the case. So I'm gonna actually pull one of the statutes open so I can read you the whole section. Um, so I'm looking at the Condo Act, RCW 6434 364 subsection 17A, but this language is in all of the statutes. And it says, when the association mails to the unit owner by first class mail, the first notice of delinquency for past due assessments, to the unit address and to any other address that the owner has provided to the association, the association shall include a first pre-foreclosure notice that states as follows. And then the form that is prescribed by the statute is literally right there in the statute. I wish I could share my screen and show you guys what it looks like. But the bottom line is the first time you send the owner a notice of their delinquency, you have to include this notice. That it is, I think this statute is very unambiguous and clear that this is required and that it has to go with the first notice of the uh, delinquency in payment of the assessments. Um, the next question that I have is on the same topic. And the question is, what if we have never foreclosed on a homeowner and we never intend to? Do we still have to send the NOD? And the answer to that question is yes, you still have to send it. Um, even if you never intend to foreclose, you're still required to comply with this very clear statutory requirement. And the legislative intent, as I discussed earlier, is not to force associations to foreclose. In fact, the legislative intent behind all of the foreclosure related legislation in the last few years has been to make it harder for everybody to foreclose and to slow down the foreclosure process. 
But the intent is to get foreclosure prevention resources into the hands of delinquent homeowners as early in the delinquency as possible. And even if your community may not foreclose, it's impossible to draft legislation that puts that imposes clear requirements like this while making exceptions for communities that aren't going to foreclose, right? It's just so hard to administer um, legislation that is ultra specific and provides for all sorts of different exceptions if you're never going to foreclose. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing that I think is worth noting is that as a practical matter, we want these resources to get into the hands of the homeowners. We are finally now, I mean, we're what, three and a half years into this COVID situation. All of the housing assistance funds that we were promised during the worst of the pandemic are finally coming through. Washington state is really lucky. I just had a conversation with a housing counselor a week or two ago, and she shared how lucky we are in Washington state because we still have millions of dollars in our housing assistance fund right now. There are a lot of states where they've just completely run out of this money. And we are seeing housing assistance fund grants come through for delinquent owners in amounts of up to $60,000 when they qualify. And so this is allowing people who are delinquent, not just on their mortgage, but their HOA dues to catch up on their balances due to their lender and to their association. The other reason why Washington state is really lucky and why this particular round of foreclosure um, funding is different is that every previous iteration of this type of grant has been limited to helping owners catch up on their mortgage. This is the first time that these monies have been available to people who need to catch up on their assessment accounts. So without the NODs, without these notices of delinquency, the homeowners will not be aware of these resources. And that is a detriment to the homeowners for sure, but it's also a detriment to the association that could be made whole by a homeowner qualifying for one of these grants. And Lest you think that I'm talking sort of theoretical numbers, I would also like to share that probably in the last three months, no, let's say six months, so I'm not exaggerating. In the last six months, I have had at least a, a dozen accounts that we were managing and trying to help our clients, you know, in terms of bringing them current, be paid in full as a result of these half grants, housing assistance funds grants. And we're talking amounts as low as two or three thousand dollars, but also as high as I had one that was almost sixty thousand dollars paid to the association. So this is real money that associations are benefiting from, but you can't benefit from it if the owners don't know about it, and the owners won't know about it if we don't send out these NODs. And also the statute says you have to, so you have to. So I'm going to keep going back to that. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Jennifer? Before I move on to the next one, uh, just briefly. One of the things that confused me about this particular question is the statement that the association would never foreclose. Hmm. And their boards have a statutory duty under the uh, Nonprofit Corporations Act to always act in the best interest of the association as a whole, not individual owners. So when you have an owner who is delinquent on assessments, the rest of the association has to basically pay that to make make up that missing those missing funds. So allowing someone to carry a balance for extremely long ter terms of time, you're probably not acting in the best interest of the association. And that's something that you should really, really consider. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that having a general preference to avoid foreclosure is one thing. But saying we will never foreclose um, has the potential to be very short-sighted and could um, mean that you're not acting in the best interest of your association. And so always, of course, again, we tell you guys all the time, this isn't legal advice, right? We're not telling you that you need to all of a sudden become very pro-foreclosure. The legislature should, certainly isn't telling you that. But you should be making individual delinquency-related decisions with the advice of your association attorney and sort of... Um, precluding one of your most effective collection options just as a matter of course because you don't like the idea is um, I think has the potential to be problematic. All right next question is also related. 
can we put a disclaimer on the notice saying that we are required to send it by law so that owners don't get mad at the board? So I'm gonna start by saying, see above regarding owners are always gonna get mad at the board. <laughs> It is an unfortunate reality of serving as a volunteer on the board of directors. I say it all the time in presentations that I give and, and talk, you know, conversations with clients that it is, it's a crappy job because the pay sucks. And, you know, people always think that you're, I don't know, taking all their assessment money and going to Hawaii or, I don't know, Vegas or something with it, right? It, it can often feel like a very, very thankless job. But I think that people are going to find ways to complain about what you're doing as a board, no matter what. And I think that your decision making as a board should not be about how to avoid the discomfort of owners complaining about you, and rather should focus on complying with state law, making sure that you're meeting your duty of care, and acting in the best interest of the association. So all of that being said, here's what I think. The contents of the notice are dictated by the statute. It's literally printed, it, I mean, down to like there's a header on the paper and everything. So the statute says the notice has to look like this. I would recommend against modifying the notice itself, which is prescribed by the statute. But I, I will offer that if you wanna include a cover letter that specifies you are sending it just to comply with state law, that would be fine. And also people are gonna be mad anyways. So that's the short answer to that question. Jennifer, did you wanna add anything to that? No. Okay. Um, next question, rather than send this with the first delinquency notice, which for us is a late statement, I would prefer to wait to send it with the first formal notice of delinquency. Do we have the latitude to interpret this as the first formal late statement if our boards concur? And I'm, I'm just going to go back to what the statute actually says. What the statute actually says is when the association mails to the unit owner by first class mail, the first notice of delinquency for past due assessments, you have to include the, the notice of delinquency. So I think that a strict plain reading of the statute requires you to include it with the first notice that you mail the owners about the delinquency. And I think it doesn't matter if that notice is a statement versus a letter and I also think that I need to say that this is a new requirement as of 2023, and there is not yet any case law interpreting this question. So it could be that if you decided not to send it with that first statement, but you send it in month two with the, the formal notice of delinquency, that a court in the future evaluating whether that was considered compliance with the statute, I mean, it's a crapshoot, right? We don't know which way the court would land on this. Generally, courts give effect to the plain language of the statute. And generally courts are not going to substitute their judgment or interpretation when the language in the statute is clear. And I have a risk averse nature, which is part of what makes me a really good attorney, <laughs> oldest child rule follower, all of those things, right? So my, my preference is that my clients send it the, with the first notice of delinquency because then I don't ever have to stand in front of a judge and try to justify why, why they chose not to do that, right? It just takes the risk out of the equation. If you wanna be the test case, um, that's that's up to, up to you. And, and the reality is decision-making um, on these things does lie with the board. And so if a board decides, look, we know what the statute says and we're gonna do it our way anyways, the, you know, the, the board has the ability to make that decision and the question is whether, you know, whether there's a, scen a scenario in which that kind of comes back to bite you in the, you know what, um, if somebody challenges the board's, you know, failure to comply with the timeline dictated by the statute. And what I'll say is that, you know, until we get some test cases, until we get some appellate cases interpreting these new statutory requirements, what we're trying to do here is look at the language of the statute, give effect to its plain meaning if it's written clearly, and then do our best to interpret when it's not. And most of our clients don't want to be the test case because that takes a really long time and it's crazy expensive. In order to create precedent that is binding, you have to take a case through the trial court level and then through an appeals case. You have to appeal it to the appellate court, go through the briefing and the arguing um, that happens at the appellate court level, and then wait for the court of appeals to issue a decision. So that costs tens of thousands of dollars. 
and most of our clients don't want to be the case, the case, the test case. So again, I'm just going to keep going back to the statute and say the safest, most risk averse way to handle this is to do what the statute says and include a copy of the pre foreclosure notice of delinquency with your first mailing to the owner telling them that, that their account is past due. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to jump to that last question since it's related to the same thing, and then we can jump on to your block of questions if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. So that's fine. we have one more question that's related to this topic, and then I'll look at the chat and see if there's follow-up questions maybe while Jennifer is talking to you about um, her topics. So we have a board telling us that our general delinquency approach as a management company violates their collection policy. Can you comment or shed some light on this? Here is our basic process. I'm completely paraphrasing this question, by the way, because it was super long. <clears throat> so this is a question that came to us from a manager. The step one for this management company is the delinquency notice, which is like the first late notice. They include the pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency that's required by the statute and a ledger. They mail all of those to the owner to all of their known addresses. Step two is no sooner than 60 days later, they mail a second notice of delinquency along with the pre-foreclosure notice that's required by the statute and um, tells them what will happen if they don't pay within a certain period of time. They also note, we cannot advance or assign to the attorney until 60 days has passed from the mailing of the final delinquency notice. And that after all of that happens, they send it to the attorney. So I want to, I have a few comments. I'm going to start by saying this. We cannot comment specifically on any particular collection policy or process because that requires legal advice, right? So if you have an association that's telling us, telling you that your process violates their collection policy, they might be right. They might be wrong. I don't know. I can't answer that question here because um, we're not giving legal advice here. I don't know what this association's collection policy says. What I will offer is collection policies are not and should not be fixed or set in stone forever. We tell our clients that they should review all of their governing documents, but particularly their policies, their rules, things like that on a regular basis to ensure that they comply with Washington state law, new case law that might have interpret the way certain requirements are, um, you know, effectuated within your documents, et cetera. And so, we have told many of our clients, in particular in 2021, when the first pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency requirement was enacted, that they needed to revisit their collection policy to make sure that it complied with these new statutory requirements. And we are also looking at collection policies again now in 2023, now that this two-step process has been enacted. So, just because your collection policy does not comport with the timeline that you described here, that alone is not a reason to throw out the timeline. The board should have the association attorney look at the collection policy and determine whether it needs to be amended, updated basically to be consistent with these new notices that are now required by the statute. Um, the other thing that I will tell you is that the process that you described is, is not necessarily consistent with the statute. So the fact that your first notice of late assessments includes a copy of the pre-foreclosure notice of delinquency absolutely complies with the statute. Love that. The fact that you wait 60 days before you send the second pre-foreclosure notice required by the statute is also great. I don't love though that there's 60 days in between letters to the owner telling them that their account is past due. And as a practical matter, I will talk a little bit about why. One thing that we know about delinquent homeowners, and this is probably true of everybody to some degree, but in particular, folks who are struggling financially, a lot of them don't read their mail. Um, and so there is a very strong chance that that first notice goes out and they don't even open the envelope, let alone read the contents of it. And so I like the idea of notifying people both early and often when their account is past due so that if they didn't look at the first notice, but they happen to open the second notice, they can, oh, hey, shoot, I didn't realize my assessment account was past due, right? So I don't love the waiting 60 days in between regular delinquency notices. Um, the way I draft collection policies and the preference that I have is that when the account falls behind, the first notice of delinquency overall goes out and of course should include a copy of 
the pre-foreclosure notice that's now required by the statute. And then 30 days later, another letter goes out to the owner saying, hey, your account is still past due. Did you know, please handle this, blah, blah, blah. So I, I love, I like the idea that more frequent notices would be mailed, but it is true that you need to wait 60 days in between sending the statutory pre-foreclosure notices. I also don't love that your policy says you cannot advance or assign to the attorney until 60 days has passed from the mailing of that second delinquency notice. Because if you think about the timeline here, that means, well, first of all, the statute doesn't say that. The statute doesn't say anything about not referring accounts to legal before any notice is, is sent. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But another thing to keep in mind is let's assume that you're sending the first delinquency notice at the end of the first month in which they haven't paid. So there may be roughly you know, 20 or 30 days behind. Plus then you're waiting another 60 days to send the second notice. And then you're telling your clients you have to wait another 60 days before referring to legal. That means these accounts are one, two, three, four, five months delinquent before you are quote unquote allowing your clients to send these accounts to their attorney for assistance. And again, this is my preference, but this is based on 16 years of practice doing exactly this type of work. The sooner an account gets to my office and the lower the balance due is when that happens, the faster, easier, cheaper, and all the good things it is for me to be able to help the owner and the association by getting that account brought current. So the longer you wait to refer accounts to the attorney, the less likely it is to be paid relatively quickly after we send our demand, the more likely it is that we have to litigate in order to bring the account current, et cetera. Um, but I really think the most important thing that I would point out is that the statute does not say anywhere that you cannot refer accounts to the attorney and it certainly doesn't say you have to wait 60 days after the second statutory pre-foreclosure notice. So all of those things being said, I also want to remind us all that the board is the one that has the authority to decide how you handle their delinquencies. I understand how attractive the idea of having a consistent internal process is that, that is the same across all associations that you manage. I, I can imagine how helpful it would be to have a streamlined process like that, how it would help you to be more profitable as a management company, how it would help reduce errors. Because if you've got a, a like a single process for all of your clients and you follow it over and over again, right? You guys have that kind of process down pat. So I do understand how attractive that is if you're trying to streamline your operations, right? But I think there's two things that I would say about that. Number one, it fails to recognize the vast difference between community associations. Some HOAs have annual assessments of $200 and some condo associations have monthly assessments of $1,200. Trying to treat all of those the same from a delinquency perspective, I think is um, impossible from a practical standpoint and it does not serve your clients well. The other thing that I want to go back to is that if the board tells you to handle delinquencies in a certain way, that is their prerogative and the management company or the manager doesn't get to tell the board, no, our internal process is X, Y, Z, and we will not do the thing that you're telling us to do. The board is the entity that gets to make decisions on the associations we have, including how to handle delinquencies. And the fact that their decision or preferred process runs afoul of your preferred internal like timeline, I don't think is enough to justify you refusing to do what the board is telling you to do. And I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not assuming that that's what you're doing. I'm using very strong language here. So I think um, the timeline as a practical matter is a little too long for me. It ignores the fact that the statute does not say anywhere that you cannot refer accounts to legal before sending these notices. The only thing that the statute could sort of, you could interpret the statute to suggest that the first pre-foreclosure notice has to be sent before it goes to counsel. Um, but even then the statute allows the association's attorney to send it if the association hasn't done it. And so I think interpreting the statute to mean that you can't start the legal process until 60 days after the second notice is a very big stretch that's not supported by the language of the statute. Um, Jennifer, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No. Okay. There are a couple of follow-up questions in the chat. 
One is about the link for housing assistance. Uh, I don't have a link for that. Um, if you go to the Washington State Department of Commerce and type in a search for foreclosure uh, or housing assistance, you could probably find the links there. Um, we, uh, the links are not in the statute because the statute says the association has to periodically check the Department of Commerce website to make sure the links and 800 numbers on the notice of delinquency are current and accurate. But if you want a couple of websites where you could go to look at like housing counselor types uh, situations and learn a little bit more about housing assistance funds, you could go to the Northwest Justice Project website um, or Northwest Housing Justice, excuse me, Northwest Housing Justice Project. And they probably have some links and information there that you could look at. Um, and then the follow-up question, the next one is, so after the first notice, can we send it to the attorney to proceed with the collections process? Or do we need to continue doing our collections process before sending it to the attorney? Um, I think the board can send an account to its attorney anytime the board determines it wants to do that. And it doesn't matter whether the second notice has been mailed before that happens. Did you want to add anything, Jennifer? No. Okay, I just talked for a really long time, so now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, the next question is, are there any Washington state laws that protect condo associations that lose their insurance coverage because of a building defect, even though the building was built to code at the time they were constructed? And this example is aluminum wiring, which was legal in the 1970s. So short answer, no. Insurers are allowed to choose what risks they will cover and what they will not cover. Um, and across the board, the insurance markets are tightening across the country because of losses. So um, this is gonna be a multi-part question. Next part of this question, is there any legal recourse for a condo complex that's losing its insurance coverage due to aluminum wiring or other similar building defects that were legal at the time the uh, building was built? So the answer is no. There's no legal recourse. Uh, insurance companies are allowed to choose what risk they will cover and what they will not. But you can also shop around, see if you can find another insurer who will cover with the information that you have. And you can also speak with a contractor, see how much it will cost to modify wiring outlets or fixtures to reduce the risk. And uh, when we were speaking with Ken earlier this morning, he noted that we've had several clients who had aluminum wiring, spoke with the insurer, spoke with the contractor and made modifications that did not include a complete rewire. And they were able to keep their insurance. It was probably a little more expensive, but it wasn't their losing coverage. Um, and Valerie, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Ken say that uh, one of the clients, the insurer wasn't aware of the aluminum wiring and when they became aware, the um, premium went from like 40 grand to over 200 grand? Yes. Something in that realm. Yes. So um, definitely talk with your insurer, talk with your contract, talk with a contractor, see what you can do. Um. So next part of the question, are there any Washington state insurance companies that will insure condos that have aluminum wiring? We can't answer that question. We we don't know. Um, but again, we do have clients with aluminum wiring that made modifications that um, were sufficient for their insurance company to keep insuring them, maybe with a higher premium. Next question, next part of this question, is it safe to buy insurance on the secondary market? The answer is yes. It's uh, have your association attorney review the um, insurance that you're looking at purchasing and your declaration to make sure that you're getting the uh, coverage required by your declaration. And typically the secondary market is much more expensive. So if you can find shop around, find someone who will insure you or make modifications to where you can keep being insured, that's probably going to be your better bet. 
And last part of this question, do you know of insurance companies in Washington that insure complexes that have pigtailed aluminum wiring? It is extremely costly to remove all aluminum wiring, but less expensive to pigtail copper to the existing aluminum. We can't answer this question because we don't have contacts with every insurance company and that's not something that we can answer in this forum. But again, we do have clients that have aluminum wiring and made modifications. So those are kind of your options there. You can contact a contractor, speak with your insurance agent and see what you can do with that. Valerie, did you have anything to add? Yeah, one thing is I just put a link into the chat, which is for the Washington State Community Associations Institute business member directory for the insurance brokers and agencies that are members. These are insurance companies and brokers who have experience insuring community associations and multifamily housing buildings. So if you're having trouble with your current insurance company, one thing you could consider is looking through the list of members that are at this link to determine if somebody with this particular type of expertise might be a better fit for you. Okay, next question. A community has a special assessment, two years left on it. The owners have been paying monthly for the past eight years. There's no documentation in the special of the special assessment, uh, the board president at the time took all association documents when they left and the association was self-governed. A new special assessment is needed for reserve projects as the original special assessment is not sufficient to cover any of the new projects. How do you suggest voiding the current special assessment to adopt a new one? So this question is a little too specific to answer in this forum. We need to see the governing documents uh, to give a specific answer. But generally, what we tell our clients is when you adopt a multi-year special assessment, you need to include the special assessment disclosures in the budget ratification packet. It addresses the argument that any owner would be unaware that this is a special assessment going, multi going over multiple years, and uh, it just helps maintain the documentation. So another thing that you can do, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the board always has the power to stop or choose to not collect a special assessment provided there's no association loan or other um, circumstances that dictate you have to have this money coming in. Um, one thing that other associations have done uh, is to take the amount of the original special assessment and wrap that into the new one and just ratify a new assessment that includes the old amounts as well. Um, it cuts down on the paperwork needed and uh, monitoring. Also, uh, the if you have no documentation for a special assessment or another assessment, you can always just re-ratify. Ratification is a pain in the rear, but it's a, a fairly simple process. You draft up the disclosures, send out the notice, and as long as a majority of the owners don't reject the budget or reject the assessment, it's ratified. So that's a quick, easy way to just make sure that you have the documentation required for an assessment. Valerie, did you have anything to add to that? Nope, I think you covered it. Um, moving on. The uh, My question is about move in, move out fees. What would be a realistic amount to charge? So this is really specific to each individual association. So, uh, when you're looking at a charge or an assessment against a particular unit, courts will often tie reasonableness to the actual cost to the association for that uh, that triggers the fee. So move in, move out fees are generally should be based on uh, specific circumstances and what the charge or how much it costs the association to have that particular activity happen. So um, the authority should be in the declaration to for this to be effective. We have had 
I believe it was just one case where the association had, I believe it was a $500 move in, move out fee. An owner challenged it. It went to court, but the association was able to verify that charge with actual exp verified expenses that they had for that particular activity. So the cost must be reasonable and it should tie to actual expenses of the association. Typically we see between 150 to $300. Um, again, it really depends on each individual association. Valerie, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, the one thing I'll say is I think move in and move out fees are actually a almost like a perfect example of how the courts tie the question of reasonableness to actual costs incurred um, by the association in connection with the event that triggers the fee. So if you are in a single family home HOA and you're trying to charge a $500 move-in fee, but there are legitimately zero expenses in connection with a new person moving in or out of your community, you're going to have a much harder time convincing the court that fee is reasonable. On the other hand, if you're in a high-rise condo and you have dedicated elevators for moving and you install and then take down elevator pads when people move in and out and your management company charges you fees to like, I don't know, you know, connect the call box and the key fobs and whatever else. And you have actual expenses that approach $500 when somebody moves in or out of your community, then it's, it's a, it's a much easier nexus and argument to make to the court that the fee is reasonable. I do also want to comment that move-in fees are not intended to create an income stream for the association. They're not intended to fund your reserves. So if part of what you're trying to accomplish with a move-in fee is, uh, you know, plumping up your reserve account, for example, then this is really something that's more like a capital contribution and should be in your declaration and should be called what it actually is. And if you put it in your declaration or an amendment to your declaration, it's much, much, much easier to defend in court because owners have actual notice of that specific fee before they sign on the dotted line to close on their home. So that's what I would add. Okay, next question. How many board members need to, need to vote yes to approve an annual budget? Is there a requirement for a quorum at the meeting at which the budget is approved? So, Budget ratification is a two-step process. Uh, this is found in RCW 6490525. Um, the board approves the budget, and then the budget disclosures and notice of meeting is, are, is sent to the owners for the ratification. So um, there's this is actually kind of an interesting question. So the board acts for the association and that's in the both the new act and the uh new act HOA act and UKIWA. So under 2403A565 and 2406140 those are the nonprofit corporations acts. Those acts specifically state and the language is pretty much verbatim or the same for both statutes. The act of a majority of the directors present at a meeting at which quorum is present shall be the act of the board of the directors. Unless the act of a greater number is required by this chapter, the articles of incorporation or the bylaws. So any act or decision of the board is by majority of quorum. There is statutory guidance for making decisions outside of a meeting and that's unanimous consent. So um, if the question is just, does the board have to approve the budget or what quorum is required for approving the annual budget, it's a majority of quorum. And unless your bylaws state otherwise, majority of quorum is majority of the owner, uh, excuse me, majority of the board of directors. So if you have a five member board, that's a approval of three. If you have a three member board, it's approval of two. Um, and business cannot be conducted without quorum. Now, if the question is regarding bud budget ratification, the board itself does not ratify the budget. That's uh, 
basically the owners, but under 6490525, budget uh, quorum is not required to ratify the budget. The budget has to be rejected by a majority of the owners, not a majority of quorum, it's a majority of the owners for the budget to be uh for the budget to be not ratified. So unless you have a majority reject the budget, the budget is automatically ratified. Valerie, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I guess the only thing I would do is in case it's helpful to super simplify this, it, the two-step process is the board votes to approve the proposed budget. In order to do that, the board has to hold a board meeting, make quorum, and then a majority of the of the board members present vote to approve that proposed budget. The only other way to do that is unanimously and in writing. And then once the board does that and mails out the disclosures, the ratification meeting happens. And what the statute says is that, I'm gonna read it straight to you guys here. Unless at that meeting, the unit owners of units to which a majority of the votes in the association are allocated or any larger percentage specified in the declaration reject the budget, then it's ratified whether or not a quorum is present. So it, at the board meeting, when you adopt the proposed budget, you have to have a quorum. At the ratification meeting, quorum is irrelevant. Ready to move on to your next one? Uh, I thought you had the next one. Oh, I can do it. You're right. I was on the wrong page. All right, next question. I was wondering what the proper steps are to remove a collections account from one attorney and transfer to another. We are not happy with a particular attorney's process and we are looking to move them to a different law firm. So I want to start by saying changing attorneys happens often and is part of the business. And it is I, so common that we all just kind of handle it like nobody's offended when you decide you want to switch law firms. Um, and so you don't need to be like worried about how the attorney is going to respond. So the steps are that you inform the current attorney to stop work on the files and that you want to transfer them to the new attorney or law firm. And you contact the new attorney's office, of course, to set up a fee agreement and send them the governing documents if you haven't already done all that stuff. And your new attorney should tell you what it is that they need for you to request from the previous attorney. I will offer as a couple comments, when we receive a request from a manager to transfer work to another law firm, we do ask for written confirmation from a board member. It can be like a one-line email. We're not looking for anything super formal. But as a reminder, the decision for which law firm an association works with is the board's decision, not the manager's decision. However, I think we also all recognize how heavily boards rely on their managers for advice on, you know, who's a good vendor for us to work with, vendors of many types, not just law firms. Um, we generally tell our clients if they're transferring files to us that we would like them to request the entire paper and electronic file specifying that we are asking for also copies of all emails about that particular account, as well as the previous law firm's invoices. And asking for those specific things allows us to have a full understanding of what has been done with that account or file. It also allows us to create a complete and accurate ledger of all of the dollars that the association has the ability to collect from that owner. So I think it's a pretty low stress process. You send an email to the old law firms, tell them what you want. Sometimes it's helpful to give a deadline because just like anybody else, we get busy sometimes and um, knowing that we're working on a deadline is helpful, but also be reasonable. Don't ask them to transfer a file in three days. That's, you know, I think generally unreasonable and probably pretty difficult for law firms to comply with. So if you ask them to make the transfer in, you know, 10 days or two weeks, I think that seems pretty reasonable. And for our part, I can tell you that 99%, um, if not more, of what we do on our collection files in particular is all electronic. So it's a pretty simple matter for us of compiling the, the files uh, and, and uploading them to a link for you to be able to download them from or, you know, sticking them on a thumb drive and putting them in the mail to the new law firm. 
Jennifer, did you want to add anything to that? No. Okay. All right. Next question. We live in a condominium with seven units. The units occasionally turn over to new residents. If an incoming resident is stretched financially, it impacts the ability of the condo association to make improvements and repairs because that owner might vote against assessments or simply be unable to pay. Is there a way for an association to legally require a net worth statement? If there is, and the incoming resident's net worth is judged to be inadequate, is there a legal means to prevent the transaction? I really wish that I could just leave this as like big fat no. <laughs> um, there is no authority, like as a starting point, I'll give you the lawyer answer. There's no authority under statute to require income assessment or net worth valuation before purchasing in your community. Um, it's possible that this could be different in a co-op and it would require a review of the specific documents for the co-op. Older condo associations used to have something that was called the right of first refusal. And it essentially was that whenever a unit owner was selling their condo, they had to submit to the board the prospective new owner's information and the board could veto or approve that purchaser as a prospective owner in the community. And some communities even still have this in their documents, although we generally advise against even trying to exercise that authority. Boards who have the power to veto certain owners can get themselves really quickly into sticky situations where discrimination and other illegal um, issues arise. Um, and, and it might not even be a conscious thing, right? It might not even be that a board is consciously discriminating against a prospective purchaser because of their national origin or their race or their uh, gender identity or whatever. But as we all know, or as we all should know, bias and discrimination don't all just happen consciously. In fact, the vast majority of bias is unconscious, okay? So I think that this is something you don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole for a lot of different reasons, legal and otherwise. I also think that in particular in the current lending climate, banks generally will not lend to someone who cannot afford the unit. So that is something to keep in mind. And I will also offer that if the change in ownership of one unit affects your finances so significantly, then you need to change your budgeting practices. So that is not the case. If you're adequately funding your reserves such that a special assessments are rare, which they should be, then this kind of becomes a non-issue for, for the most part. One of the comments in the question is, you know, they might sort of hurt the association by voting against assessments. Well, it's a good thing that one unit owner can't tank an assessment, right? In order for a, an assessment, a special assessment or an annual budget to be rejected, more than 50% of the voting power in the community has to vote against it. And so you're not, you're not failing to pass a special assessment because of that one unit owner. It's because multiple unit owners in your community are voting against it. So I just, no, no caution tape, big red flags. Like I don't, I, this is not something that is a good idea. And also we, there's no statutory provision to allow this. Jennifer, you think we have time for you to motor through one more of your questions? Yeah, this next one's actually pretty simple and quick. So this question is, if a board member states in a board meeting, let the minutes reflect, does this require the statement to be included in the minutes or can the board decide not to include the statement? If an owner ha uh, ma makes the same statement, let the minutes reflect. Does that require that that particular statement is included in the minutes? So the answer is not necessarily. The uh, minutes should never have be a verbat verbatim re record of what was said at the meeting. Um, the specific words, let the minutes reflect, do not need to be in board meeting minutes. Um, the level of detail in the minutes is generally up to the board, but should include motions made and items discussed. Uh, statute requires that a member's no vote be recorded if requested. So if a uh, motion is made, the vote happens, a board member uh, votes no, and then asks that the, that no vote be reflected in the minutes, that should happen. If the board's uh, if the board president says let the minutes reflect and it represents a motion, so uh, the board has a discussion. Um, everyone's ready to make a vote. The board president says let the minutes reflect that the motion to do X Y Z was made. 
that motion or a notation that that motion happened should be in the minutes. And um, I think that's pretty much it for that question. Valerie, did you have anything to add? I just think let the minutes reflect are not magic words that require you to include everything that follows those words in the minutes. And I think Jennifer's reminder that the board gets to decide the level of detail and that you at minimum include a record of all motions and decisions, that's what your minutes are for. Not a verbatim report of proceedings like a court reporter might take down. So with that, we are at 11 o'clock, which means we're out of time. There were a couple of questions we didn't get to, so we will start next week with those. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you guys back here next week. Bye everybody.